Hello class, welcome back to our second lecture video here on Unit 6. In this lecture video, we're going to take the time to go over some key vocab terms that are going to help us better understand certain types of questions we'll get as we move on to more advanced topics here in this unit, such as actually looking at the process of mitosis in each of its individual steps. So let's get started with that. So here we are in the PowerPoint. So we're going to focus on eukaryotic cell types in regards to overall cell division. And we're going to start with two terms here. We have somatic cells and gametes. Somatic cells are what we're going to look at for this first part of the unit in relation to mitosis. And gametes, sex cells, another way to look at them, um, is what we'll be seeing as we, and what we make during the process of meiosis. So to get started here, all right, just bring up all this information. Somatic cells are also called body cells. So these are any type of cell in your body that's not sperm or egg. So even the cells in your testicles, guys, that make sperm, they're still considered body cells. Ladies, the cells that are in your ovaries that make eggs are still considered somatic cells. All right, so anything that's not a reproductive cell itself. These cells generally have a very specific function as they become specialized, as you turn into you um, through fetal development. Cells will become skin cells, liver cells, heart cells, you name it. All right, and they'll take on a very specific function overall. In regards to humans, what I want you to remember is human somatic cells will have 46 total chromosomes each. So in every one of our body cells, we have a total of 46 chromosomes. Sperm or egg, all right, would only have 23, because remember what we talked about in sexual reproduction, each parent contributes half the genetic information that turns into an actual human. And again, gametes or sex cells, and then down below, in contrast, these are only going to be sperm and egg. And they will have 23 single chromosomes in them. So again, reminder, I hit the button a little too fast, sorry, I apologize. But again, if you look up here, the whole way it works, dad gives you 23 chromosomes, mom gives you 23. You get what's called a zygote that turns into you, or Jim Smith here in the diagram. And then, so he would have 46 chromosomes in each of his cells, and eventually Jim will produce Jim Smith sperm, <laughs> ridiculous, which will only have 23 chromosomes apiece, but they'll be varied. They'll be different, obviously, than whatever he received from each of his parents, which is why we see that variation in our offspring. Now, to can kind of piggyback off those two terms, somatic and gametes, we have now what's called diploid and haploid. Di obviously means two, and we're going to have a little mathematical symbol here, 2n. Now, what does n mean? n refers to the number of unique chromosomes that an individual species can have. So for you and I, I want you to remember that n is actually equal to 23. There really only are 23 unique different types of chromosomes that humans possess. Hell, remember what I just told you on the other slide? That we have a total of 46 chromosomes. So a diploid cell, all right, is going to have paired chromosomes. One that they get from each parent. So in other words, if you look up here, 2n, well, if we have two versions for every n type of chromosome, our diploid number n is 2 times 23 which is that total of 46. So we're going to have 23 pairs of chromosomes for a total of 46 in all of our somatic cells. All right, so again, all somatic cells would be considered diploid. And then diploid cells are only made during mitosis. Haploid cells are considered to be just N, hap or half the potential genetic total information. So our haploid cells, our sperm and egg, are just going to be N, meaning that they will only have 23 chromosomes in each one of them. All right, so they're not going to have a pair of chromosomes. They're going to have just one single copy of each chromosome type. So you should make a note that our N value for sperm or egg, again, will be 23 while a diploid or human diploid 2n value would equal 46. Again, it's only the sperm and egg cells that would be considered haploid. 
and haploid cells, we'll learn later on in the second half of this unit, are made during the process of meiosis or meiosis, however you prefer to say it. All right, but again, sperm or egg are not made during mitosis. Those are just body cells or another way to look at them, diploid. Here's some pictures just to kind of help reinforce that. So again, diploid up here on the left, 2N, two copies of each chromosome. So here there's three chromosome types. And you could tell based on the difference in sizes you have here. But I have a pair for each type, right? So I have three types of chromosomes in this example. And I have two versions for each type. So you can see I have a pair. So the 2N value for this example would actually be 6. 2 times how many unique types do you see below? I see three unique types based on their size differentials. So 2 times 3 would be 6. Haploid is just N. So a sperm or egg cell would have just one version of these three types. And that's what you see here. You just have three chromosomes, one version for each potential type. Again, just another slide trying to show you the difference between diploid and haploid. Again, you have three pairs here, two versions for each pair. So that's your diploid number. Up top here, your haploid, you just have N or one version for each type. And one of our last vocab terms here, a homologous pair. Prefix homo obviously means the same. So what does a homologous pair refer to? All right, this is going to be a pair of chromosomes that are both similar in both shape, size, length, however you want to say it. So if I look down here at this diagram, here are two homologous pairs. All right, you can see how this pair matches up. All right, besides the length and size, the location of the centromere, which is this little indentation here I'm pointing at, and you can see that over here in these diagrams, those would always be in the same location. All right, again, you wouldn't want to pair up one of these large ones with a small one because they will not have the same genetic information on them. They're not homologous. And besides being the same in both shape and size, when you actually see these under a microscope in real life, not just animated, they have these thick banding patterns to them that are unique. Okay, these banding patterns here are unique. And a version of a chromosome from mom and the version of that same chromosome from dad, who are homologous, you're going to see those same banding patterns also in the same locations. Okay, those specifically are the genes, sections of the DNA that code for a specific trait. Like right here, maybe this thick blue band codes for hair color, and so does this one from mom. But the way they interact together is what ultimately, according to genetics, when we learn about that later this year, will dictate what trait that is. Maybe dad gives you the gene for black hair. Mom gives you the version of the gene for blonde hair. When they interact together, you're probably going to have some shade of brown as a result. Not necessarily, but most times that's what you would see. So again, here are single chromosomes, but you would not see them until after they've been duplicated later on in mitosis. So even here, here would still be a homologous pair, but you still have just two versions now of this chromosome that's been duplicated, along with this version from another parent that's also been duplicated, and they're both currently, both sides would be identical copies of the chromosome, but they're currently connected in the middle by what we call a centromere.